Okay, hi everyone. Thanks for coming. It was a great turnout. Um, I want to thank President Sullivan and uh, Dan and Carol Durack uh, <coughs> Fund for hosting our speaker today. And special thanks to Emeritus Professor Beth Mintz, uh, my friend and dear colleague, for the inspiration to bring our speaker here today. My name is Kathy Fox. I'm a professor in sociology. Um, and I'm grateful for the chance to introduce you to Elizabeth Armstrong. Um, we've only brought a few sociologists here on a Barack lecture, William Julius Wilson and Todd Gitlin. So Elizabeth, you are in great company. So um, her CV is too long for me to recount, so I'll just give you some highlights. Uh, she's professor of sociology and organizational studies at the University of Michigan. Currently, she's enjoying a fellowship at Stanford and has been a fellow at, at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. Her first book, published by University of Chicago Press, entitled Forging Gay Identities, Organizing Sexuality in San Francisco, 1950 to 1994, um, she, her, that earlier work was related to social movements, but began the thread of research into sexuality and sexual identities. Um, in recent years, her work has received a lot of attention because of its topical relevance about things like hookup culture, slut shaming, and sexual assault on campus. Her recent book uh, with her co-author Laura Hamilton, um, and the one that she will talk about today is called Paying for the Party, How College Maintains Inequality, published by Harvard University Press. The book has been very well received, both as a scholarly work and as a work of significant import for higher education. It's received multiple awards and mentions. Most notably, it received the American Sociological Association Distinguished Scholarly Book Award in 2015. That means it's the best book of all sociology books written. Um, and it was also commended by other associations and sections uh, due to the breadth of its contribution to things like cultural sociology, educational sociology, stratification in organizations, gender, and sexuality. And sociologists have long recognized that social class is reproduced and that many, although not all individuals, end up in the same social class as their parents. And one very important question is the role of education in this dynamic. Parts of the process are well understood, that schools in affluent neighborhoods prepare students to apply to elite colleges, that SAT prep courses help, uh, that highly educated parents are very good at helping students, um, not to mention the cash that allows participation in high status campus activities. Paying for the party brings home the importance of all this with rich descriptions of how the economic, cultural, and social capital of the women in a party dorm at a large Midwestern university contributes to their success. But it doesn't stop there. For sociologists, individual characteristics and actions are crucially important, but only part of the story. The other part is about the ways in which uh, societal arrangements within which individuals function, what we call structure, shape and constrain our lives. And um, this is an enormous contribution to our understanding of social class reproduction, um, th this book. One of the things that it does very well is, um, as an ethnography, uh, really speak to these social structural processes, which a lot of ethnographies um, do less well. So, um, oops, yeah, hold on, what did I do? Um, so in full disclosure, I have known Elizabeth since our days together in graduate school at UC Berkeley, where we both got our PhDs. And I want to say three important things about her. Number one, Elizabeth was the person who late at night after a beer or two when we'd be chatting, which is why grad school is the best, um, would virtually analyze everything, anything, late into the night. She would enthusiastically dissect popular culture, campus life, cohort dynamics, feminist pornography, anything and everything was ripe for deconstruction. Um, in short, she is one of the, the most intellectually curious people I know, which makes her a delight to be around, at least for another sociologist. Um, she was known then and is known now as an intellectual force. Number two, her work demonstrates beautifully the extended case method promoted by Michael Borovoy from Berkeley, which advocates using field data to, re to test and revise macro level theory. Uh, paying for the party is a careful example of using ethnographic data to make structural arguments effectively 
And it's one of the best illustrations of Bourdieu's uh, social, cultural capital that I have ever read. Um, it has tremendous real world and policy implications. It, the book is very clearly written and accessible, but its implications are quite deep. Finally, number three, Elizabeth as a humble and lovely person whom I'm proud to call a friend and delighted to introduce you to. So please welcome uh, Professor Elizabeth Armstrong. <laughs> Okay, I hope I got the mic turned on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you, Kathy, for that lovely introduction. Um, it is um, one of the joys of academic life is that relationships are extend over decades um, often, and so um, I um, very much appreciate that. And thank you very much, all of you, for inviting me here to join you today. Um, and um, I look forward to sharing a little bit with you about um, paying for the party, how college maintains inequality. Um, one of the things I want to start with here that's very important is pointing out that this is um, a collaborative book, that um, it's co-authored equally with Laura Hamilton. Um, this is very important as it will become increasingly evident as I tell you a little bit about the process of doing the research because Laura collected the vast majority of the data for this project. Um, and in fact, my inability to collect the data for the project due to my age and social location, my inability to fit in to college life at the time that the project um, that we collected the data was actually a really huge tip off in terms of the kind of argument that we ended up making. But as a consequence, it was crucial to have an ethnographer who could fit in in order to, in order to collect the data. And I'll tell, tell a little bit more about that as I go along. Um, but without Laura, no book. Um, so, this is a case study of a mid-tier flagship university. This, this picture is, is, of, is of University of Nebraska. I mean, we didn't study the University of Nebraska, but we probably could have. Um, it was a big public Midwestern research university, um, a school known as a party school. They have these lists, like you can go Google and find out like what's the top 10 party schools. This, the school we studied was a school that frequently made it, makes it onto this list. Um, it's a school that people look to when they're thinking about a, a kind of quintessential college experience. Um, so we, we um, kind of wanted to study this in part because uh, understanding college life in the US um, means studying these kinds of organizations and where we are now is also kind of um, you know a school very much like this in some ways and actually in the Q&A it would be really really interesting to have um, thoughts about ways in which there are similarities and differences um, that's as I've talked about the book that's been a kind of interesting ongoing conversation like where where the where how universities vary um, but, but this, is, this kind of experience is consequential for many, many, many people. Um, so we wanted to understand it better. So um, what did we do? We got a room on the dorm floor. <laughs> so we got a room on, um, on, in a party dorm at a party school. And so this, um, there's also, you can go Google this too, you can find, like the top 10 party dorms USA and this particular dorm where we were in would definitely make that list. So, um, so we, after we got the permissions and we got our dorm room and, they, and we, we, moved, we moved in, we, uh, we didn't have our room kind of was a little pathetic compared to the rooms of other uh, people on the floor. It was a women's floor and all these other rooms, there was just like explosions of pink. Um, pink everything and all this brand new stuff and our room didn't look so good but we had a room and we um, and I, I was hanging out there too and then this comes back to Laura it was about um, within the really the first day of moving on onto the floor that that the problem of me as the ethnographer became abundantly clear 
when the parents started asking me, like, are you moving a kid into the dorm? And at that point, I was horrified. My own son now is 22. He's finishing college. But at that point, I was like, no, this can't be. No, they can't think I'm a parent. But, but the parents clearly were identifying me. And the, and the students were like, they were, when we were like hanging out in our room, there were some guys coming to visit the, the women who were living across the, the hall. And they were like, there's an adult on the floor, adult on the floor. And I was like, uh-oh. Um, but I was still kind of optimistic that I could, that I could kind of hang out there. And, and I kind of did manage to sort of find my way on the floor a little bit in the sense that I became friends with the kind of other pariah women on the floor, kind of. The, the, the individuals who gravitated to me were those who were also struggling to find a place and fit in. And this is, of course, what kind of tipped us off that status and fitting in and was a really big deal. Laura, who um, was a graduate student, um, substantially younger, from a, a white woman, from a class privileged um, background, um, who kind of had already some social ties with kind of people on the floor, was just infinitely better able to fit in. She, she was still wearing, like, she could still shop at Abercrombie. I don't know if people still shop there, but yeah, she was still wearing, like, like high school body clothes, and which is what one of the other um, students referred to, like, these 18-year-olds as they, they're like, they had high school bodies. As they, they were very, very young. So she could still kind of fit in and collect the, collect the data, which turned out to be crucial, because we got there, and we just got very, very interested in what was happening in these young women's lives. They called each other girls at the time. Um, they did not identify as adult at all. Um, but we got interested. We interviewed them all the first year, and then again, second, third, fourth year after they graduated, and again at age 30. And we have, up all the way through, we have, of the 53, we have 45 of them. So, and that was all Laura, her relationships. And she, she figured out things that, such as like that first year when we were making the ties with them, that in order to persuade some of the very high status women on the floor to participate, that she needed to communicate three things to them in approximately one minute. One is that someone higher status than them on the floor had already participated in an interview, hence it was an in thing to do, that participating in the interview meant that they could talk about whatever they wanted to talk about, that they could just, that it wasn't going to be guided, that they could sort of say whatever they wanted or not, or not disclose whatever they wanted, and that we were not going to lurk around them and essentially contaminate their status, that we were going to, that we were not going to um, kind of be intrusive in terms of hanging out with them. Because they were, they were, they were very much concerned about how, who they were seen with um, reflected on their status. And me, as pariah on the floor, um, one of the young women in particular, our mean girl on the floor, um, whom we called Whitney, she would actually book the other direction when she saw me. She would literally turn around and like try to physically move <laughs> as far away from me as, as, as she could get. And, and then on the opposite stance, we also had some undergraduates on the floor with us also collecting data as well. And one of them was this young woman who was in a very high status sorority on campus. And um, Whitney and some of the other women who wanted to rush would kind of just totally like glom onto her and sort of interrogate her about how to have a perfect rush and how to do rush and, and kind of just like pepper her with questions. So much so that we actually had to remove Whitney from the floor because it was becoming a problem for Whitney in terms of the way sororities on this campus understood appropriate relationships between women in sororities and women who were kind of potential new recruits that, that you were supposed to maintain a distance and it was posing in the, in, the, in the world of the Panhellenic Association kind of an ethical quandary because she was not supposed to have this much tie. Um, so, with, so until Rush was over, um, um, this, this particular undergraduate was like pulled off the floor. So again, 
status, fitting in, popularity, um, really, really important. Um, so, um, but then what we were also, um, so there's that. And so some people might think that, okay, status, popularity, social life, that that has, that that's its own thing, that it has nothing to do with the academic side of college. One of the things we try to show in paying for the party is that the social side, popularity, going out, hooking up, relationships, Greek life, and social class and academic success and, and what happens in college, that these are all connected. That they are, it's not like there's this like social stuff over here and then there's the hard work of, of the academic side, and, um, and it, but these things are connected. Um, those who had an easier time of it socially also in, in, um, kind of in some ways had fared well better academically. And we argue in the book in general that how well the students did kind of on in really all dimensions, socially, academically, um, personally, um, was a result of the fit between the, um, what they brought into the situation and what the university provided. And that at this school, the whole game and play, the organizational arrangements set up, everything from the classes, the majors, Greek life, residence life, all of it was set up to really serve the most affluent students the best. Um, so the students that ended up being like the, the high um, kind of status students on the floor were also not accidentally, not coincidentally, the wealthiest students on the floor as well, that there was this kind of fit between, it's like who they were, what they expected of college, um, what they brought with them, kind of both um, kind of culturally and actually literally um, in terms of their clothes and their cars and all of that stuff. And the university, what the university provided, um, it just was a really good fit and, and the other students were just ended up struggling. So another way that this book kind of challenges some um, other um, prior investigations of college life is that there's been a tendency to see like, oh yeah, Greek life might have some problems, maybe hazing or maybe sexual assault, maybe there's problems within Greek life, but those, it doesn't spill over to those students who don't participate. We argue it's all, it's a full picture that, that the, um, the excesses or problems of Greek life actually also have a consequence for the climate and experiences of those students who um, either can't or choose not to elect in these, in these worlds, um, that, these, that these can't be looked at in isolation. And this is in general also between the, 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 the experiences of students who with less class privilege are deeply informed by the ways in which they're treated and the interactions they have with more affluent students so that you can, that the kind of class dynamics are deeply relational as well. Like, and this of course would apply for gender and race as well. That that you, you can't understand sort of marginalization on college campuses without understanding the behaviors of the people who are, have the power to engage in marginalization of others, right? Just looking at the experience of, of those who have been marginalized, it won't tell us like how this marginalization occurs. So, um, so today, uh, in terms of to kind of show you a little bit about the book, I'll talk about a little bit more about the women on the floor, um, where they came from. I'll talk um, about the kind of organizational arrangements, what we call the college pathways. And then I'll talk a little bit about how these things come together, how kind of these women intersect with the kind of the pathways that they, that they found. And then we'll open it up for questions. Um, so these women, so when we moved onto the floor, we're like, okay, okay, 53 people, we're gonna figure them all out. We're gonna get to know them. Um, it was really rough. Um, they were all white. They were all but two straight. They were all but one American born. And even more than that, they only had 37 fully distinct names. There were more than one room on the floor where there were two girls with the same name. Um, so, so then there was this kind of practice of like, slight variations, it's like, you know, Katie, Kate, Catherine, 
you know, uh, like the people would sort of modify, like, you know, you couldn't, you know, if there was two of, you know, two, two Al, if there's two Allisons, one was Allie, right? So they were kind of, there's this pattern of a kind of modification of the name so people could be uh, kind of sorted out. But it was really hard <laughs> to work out. And then we had a little bit initially of like um, a kind of sociological kind of downer moment and that we were kind of, we were hoping to also study a living learning center. We wanted to compare two um, residence halls on the same campus, but we got kicked out of that hall because the um, <laughs> that was actually the only time in the whole field work process that I cried. I was really upset. I was just like, this is horrible. We're like losing our access. And the um, academic advisor for the academic for the for the Living Learning Center, they kind of they kind of understood how objectifying it is to be um, part of part of research. And so they were like, no, our you know our students in the Living Learning Center, no, we can't let them to be studied. But the people, the people were much the the kind of residence life student affairs people were much more concerned about the the misbehavior of the individuals living in the party dorms. So they were like, okay, sure, move in, study, study, study these folks. Um, so, um, so we only had we didn't have access, in the, and then we wanted a co-ed floor, but we didn't get a co-ed floor. We wanted to look at men too. We didn't just just only we weren't just only interested in women. It was just like this is what we could get. And then we arrive, and it looks like we have 53 replications of exactly the same person. Um, and we're like, sociology is all about variation. And we're like, what are we going to do with this? Um, turns out there was one really big source of variation on the floor, which I've already kind of hinted at, which was social class. Um, about half the women, 45%, were from what we call less privileged backgrounds, working, lower middle, and middle class backgrounds, and slightly more than half were from more privileged backgrounds. To kind of give you an example of the extreme nature of the class um, diversity on this floor, those um, from working class backgrounds, their parents were doing things like, um, like um, being a checker at a grocery store, um, child care, um, working as you know electric line person I mean just really like working class jobs um, no um, higher education themselves the people in upper class positions these were women from families where their fathers owned things owned um, like a construction company kind of operating in the entire southeast of the US or they were in um, Wall Street in extremely lucrative um, fine, uh, professions in finance. These were, uh, by upper class, we meant um, individuals from families where they, from their parents, received no notion whatsoever of financial constraint being an issue. Like the upper middle class with, their, um, with the parents being like doctors and lawyers, they, the, the women would sometimes get the sense of like, you know, you, we really might not be able to afford that. Um, the women from upper class families, they didn't, they weren't getting those messages. They were generally given um, a credit card and they never saw the statements. They never, they never had a sense that there was any, any moment where money would ever run out. Um, so, and, and this is um, the notion that 19% of the women fell in this group. I mean, that's, that's odd because we're talking here about people in with a kind of one to five percent of the upper end of the American class distribution. Very, very wealthy um, individuals were very overrepresented in this space. They're overrepresented at this university in general. This is a place where um, wealthy um, children of the, of the coastal elites send their kids to school, but they were also overrepresented in this dorm because this was um, in terms of the selection of the dorm, the um, out-of-state wealthy um, families knew that this was the right place to live. So they, there was a process of sort of selection into um, a particular residence halls, and these individuals knew. And then that raises the question, like, how did the less privileged individuals get into this particular residence hall? It was because they were too clu clueless and didn't know any better. Um, and they said that right off the bat. They were just like, I did not intend to be on a dorm floor with everyone I didn't like in high school, um, is what some of them said. Or like, 
where did all of these like super rich people come from? Like this was not my plan. But one of the sort of class differences we observed is that is that the privileged women, if there was something about their social life, their residential situation that they didn't like, they immediately appealed to student life and asked for a change. They felt entitled to a fun um, college experience, and the instant they thought that that, that that was not being realized, they pushed and advocated for a change. I want a new roommate. I want to move to a different floor. I want to move to a different dorm. Um, they would have their parents come and like help them load up all their stuff and make the change. But the less privileged individuals, they felt like they had to take whatever it is they got. So they got, they got stuck on this floor, and so they just assumed that that was that. And they didn't necessarily have an expectation that college was supposed to be fun or that, it, or that they were entitled to like, have a good time in college. So they were like, okay, this kind of sucks, it's college. Um, so they didn't, they didn't push, they didn't push to move. In fact, um, there, some of the individuals from less privileged backgrounds who had the worst experiences on the floor, they made no friends, they were completely isolated and marginalized. They came back and lived in the same floor in the same dorm another year. They didn't even, they didn't even try in the next year to address their situation because they just felt, yeah, well, at least this I know. I know uh, how to get to class from this, from this dorm. I know, I, I get it. And they, they didn't, um, although some of those individuals over the course of four or five years in college gradually made changes to move closer to um, groups of uh, friends that they liked or kind of situations that worked better for them, but it was not an easy process at all. Um, and that was one of, that was something that was so surprising to us because we kind of, from like pretty much one of the defining characteristics of anyone who ends up in a faculty position or ends up in student affairs or ends up working for the university, are these are adults who somehow managed to successfully navigate college. And so it sort of selects on people who um, were able to kind of, in some way, even if it was rather difficult, to kind of find places on campus that were fits for them. And so it's hard, it's hard for, for adults to kind of get it, like that some people, when they arrive on campus, just are not um, positioned to be able to kind of go, oh, I think that I'm gonna fit in best over here and I will go and join that club, or, or this dorm isn't a good fit, I'm gonna to move to that dorm. So this issue of like how difficult it is to kind of navigate around, particularly a very large university, to find, um, find a good spot, people didn't. And um, that that's actually was a surprise for us. So here are the women. So, they, so, um, so we have, so the working class, you know, um, people doing childcare, upper class, um, people who own, um, like large companies, really different resources. Um, and so, so that's what they're kind of bringing with them. But then the kind of notion of the college pathway. So we often show this slide to give a sense that, um, that colleges build out um, different ways through them. Like, there's, there's maybe a temptation to see every single student's movement through college as entirely unique. Like, you know, everyone, it's like they have their own particular set of courses, their own experiences, it's, and it's highly, completely individual in particular. Actually, from the point of view of the university, it's much more efficient to kind of batch process people, to, to deal with people in groups. Like, to deal with, um, like, oh, all students who are sort of conventional age, 18 years old, who are living in the residence hall are gonna have a certain set of needs and a certain set of, 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 of um, kind of their, their we, they all need a meal plan, they all need this or that. And the more, like, more similar one is to the modal, conventional, traditional sort of a, student, the student that the architecture is built for, the kind of easier the experience is likely to be. Like on this, like imagine a navigating the set of highways on a moped or by foot. Not going to be very easy, right? It's like, it's like if you're, these, these are highways built for automobiles, um, on a bicycle wouldn't work so well. 
Um, having a bicycle is no, is no better or worse, maybe we could argue better than having a car, but, um, but it's not gonna be effective for this situation. So that's kind of the notion of fit. It's like, it's like what um, the universities are sort of building out their whole, um, their residence life arrangement, the kind of classes, the majors, the whole social experience around thinking about a particular kind of student. And as it turns out, the, the most sought after kind of student for um, cash starved um, public universities that need full um, paying tuition students potentially from out of state is um, a kind of an affluent white student. Um, and that um, student often what they want when they're looking for college is they want a party experience. They want the conventional social experience. They often want a party pathway. So among the women, as we interview them and we ask them what they were looking for in college, um, they would tell us that, like one woman in particular, Hannah, she told us, she, her father was a chief financial officer of a company. She, she was from the East Coast. She um, was very, very social in high school. She went in, in, and visited 10 different party schools to find the absolute best party school. Um, you know, she didn't want, some were too cold, some were too urban, some were this, some were that, but she wanted the school with the best sports, the most school spirit, the most successful athletic teams, the best Greek life, um, the prettiest campus, um, all of those things. And so they, she systematically with her, with, they, it was not about academics or what majors were on offer, it was like what, what school provided the best party pathway. Um, and yeah, so what provides a party pathway, Greek life, um, ways residence life is organized, and the easy major. Um, and so some, some, there's a tendency to think like, oh, you know, um, y universities, they, they, they don't really are, they're not interested in the student partying, the kind of, the student drinking and excess is like, is, is something that isn't part of um, the institutional arrangements of the school, but it's something that, that just happens. That that the uh, the form that the adults, the administrators, are always trying to figure out how to kind of um, nip in the bud, basically. And 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 part of it is is it is very much true. I mean, I had been meetings with folks in student affairs today, and we had a very very interesting conversations about you know what are strategies to reduce drinking on this campus and things like that. And so yes, there are definitely people who are very interested in um, kind of reducing the party pathway. And one of the kind of interesting features of, of universities as organizations is that their they're different component parts run at cross purposes with each other. They're not coherent, they're not consistent. And so the um, provision, particularly at this school where Greek life was huge, um, and uh, residence life was, was designed in a way that meshed really tightly with Greek life. And where there were a ton of super easy majors, um, that, um, that definitely enabled, enabled the party pathway. Like one of the things, um, at University of Michigan where I'm at, which is not where this was done, the party pathway is somewhat constrained by the difficulty of the academics. It is also enabled by the big house, you know, go blue football, all of that. So there's things that kind of run at cross purposes. But at this school, there was a lot of stuff moving in the same direction in terms of supporting the party pathway. Um, so this, this, the, the picture here is, this isn't from the campus that I studied, but this is, this is an example of the sort of scale of, and size and of the uh, fraternity and sorority houses at this university. And that, I mean, so this is a place where, um, that there were, you know, almost two dozen um, fraternities and like almost 20 um, sororities. So this was a big, big part of, of the college experience there. Um, mobility pathway, this is um, uh, the notion that schools should help out individuals who are coming from a disadvantaged background by le leveling the playing field, by kind of doing all kinds of things like um, while well, teaching well, making it affordable, um, kind of having kind of on-ramps to professional pathways through kind of making kind of any kind of um, 
uh, compensation in terms of education that, that has happened. And one of the things that was really striking for us in studying the school was like almost complete absence of mobility pathways. And in fact, it wasn't, we didn't even understand that a mobility pathway could really be a thing until like being at Michigan and seeing this kind of uh, the scale and the kind of architecture built out in the comprehensive studies program and Summer Bridge and things like that. It's like, oh, wow, universities can provide scaffolding to try to help individuals from less privileged background kind of succeed, that this is, a, this is something that universities do because it wasn't really happening at any scale at the school that we studied. Um, and then a professional pathway is kind of sort of stereotypically what one would might assume that college in general is about. It's about um, kind of providing routes into law, medicine, finance, academia, academically serious and the like. And one of the things we found here was that um, helicopter parents were essentially a requirement for success on the professional pathway. The party pathway was so distracting and engaging that without parents constantly going, so um, do you really think you should be going out? Uh, maybe you need to think about like telling your, um, your roommate that you need to stay in tonight. So th there were, we found um, that parents um, who understood, who were very savvy, they understood that their, their student was at a school with a lot of distractions and they were paying a lot of attention. So there the picture is someone not just in the helicopter, but kind of like really like literally in the car helping, helping, helping navigate the, the situation. Um, yeah, so I'll tell you a little bit more about like how this, how this actually kind of worked, worked out. But first, um, so from, from our, um, the women from less privileged backgrounds, most of, many of them were of course on the mobility pathway by necessity and um, some did try to participate in the party pathway and some did participate in the professional pathway. The privileged women um, were um, split between the party and the professional pathway and so we ended up in the book dividing them into these categories where the socialites were the ones who partied, 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 partied the whole way through with no negative consequence. They had enough class resources that it really didn't matter how much they partied. Everything was going to be fine. Um, the wannabes were the ones who were party, 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 but in fact, they were wannabe socialites in the sense that they thought they could um, party hard and everything was going to work out just fine, but as it turns out, that wasn't really true. Um, as one of the wannabes told us after graduation, nobody told me that Disneyland was going to end. Um, as she was ha moving back home with her parents and realizing that her degree was not really adequate to get her the kind of job that she wanted after partying so hard. Um, what the wannabes didn't understand was that the socialites had parents that were going to continue to fund essentially infinitely at high levels all the way through their 20s, that there was no point at which the kind of support was going to end. So that's one way in which class is invisible in the sense that yes, it's, you can kind of tell in college whether someone has enough money for the jewelry and the jeans and the spring break trips, but one of the things you can't tell is whether someone has parents with so much money that they are going to continue to pay um, to support at that level in perpetuity, right? And so that's, that's one of kind of big differences. The, um, some of the privileged women came from families where um, the, they were kind of what we called cl uh, cultivated for success. They ended up performing academically really well. We called them achievers. Even um, some of the women from privileged backgrounds didn't actually be, become achievers. We called them underachievers in part because of the sort of distractions of the party pathway. Um, and then those on the mobility pathway were split between those who graduated um, and those who left the university before um, graduation. Um, one of the things which I won't have time to talk about is actually those who left did better than those who stayed. And that co runs counter to all conventional wisdom um, and all quantitative social science stratification research 
which thinks that if you just stick it out, just stay, everything is going to be much better. In fact, these, the organizational arrangements were so poorly set up for less privileged students on the mobility pathway that the sooner they figured out that the game and play was not for them and got out, the better they did. They didn't leave college altogether, but they moved to um, schools where they were going to be better served. Um, and some of them were quite steely-eyed about it. They're just like, when they figured out, they're like, wait, I see who's, who's, who, this, who this whole, th what's happening here and, what, and that this is not for me. I need, this is too expensive. I'm acquiring too much debt. Th these majors are useless. I'm getting sucked into partying. I need to get out. Um, and the sooner they did, the better they did. Um, so, yeah. So that's a kind of an overview. But then I'm going to go into like one, one particular case um, next. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Naomi and Karen. So this goes more into the socialite versus wannabe story. So Naomi, Naomi was from an upper middle class, possibly upper class family. Her father owned a company. Um, she her wanted, wanted to come to this university to meet new people and to join a tan, jan, dance team and because she thought her in-state school was too hard. Actually, she was from Michigan, actually. <laughs> um, but she, she thought it was, no, you know, no way U of M. Like, uh, and Michigan State, she thought she knew too many people. So she wanted to meet people just like herself, but um, different people, uh, different, like, wealthy white students, but not the same wealthy white students she already knew from her high school. Um, so that was her motivation. Karen was from in-state, um, and for a lot of middle-class in-state students attending the, the, the flagship school is basically the default. That's how she ended up, she ended up at the school. Um, in some ways, their social lives, their experiences of college were really similar. They both partied hard, really hard. They both uh, joined sororities, and they both um, actually ended up um, majoring in sports communication. What is sports communication? Um, it is an easy major. I mean, there is like, I mean, Naomi was, uh, she was flat, she was, she was quite bright, and she was just like, yeah, there's no content here at all. And in fact, Naomi was, <laughs> Naomi was very close to her parents, and when her parents arrived for graduation, they could not find Naomi on the graduation program because the graduation program was sort of separated by majors, and her parents actually had no idea what she was majoring in, so they couldn't find her. Um, yet she was talking with her parents every day, and so from the, her parents' perspective, what she was doing academically when she was in college was also utterly beside the point. Um, Karen, uh, transferred to sports communication, even though her, her family had um, wanted her to go. Um, they felt that she would be a good teacher. They felt that was an appropriate career path for her. They thought she should do elementary ed. But she learned about sports communication um, from a girl on the floor, thought, yay, let's do that, partially because she just liked boys a lot and thought, and particularly athlete boys, and thought that being able to interview them in locker rooms was like, awesome. I mean, that was pretty much what her, 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 her notion was um, about this. Um, and so, and then, um, but then what she, what she didn't figure out, and I think um, maybe this will come up later, but what she didn't understand is that actually being, um, being in the field of sports is a really male-dominated field. It's really hard work. You have to travel a lot. I mean, that it's actually, that you have to do tons of internships. She had no concrete notion of what that career path might actually look like or entail, but it sounded really great. And, and in fact, uh, there was a whole set of majors that we, we saw as being like um, soft skill network dependent majors, all these kind of glamor industries, sports, um, kind of communication, uh, media, film, kind of all, all of these kind of majors. It's entirely possible to have wildly successful careers in these fields. But most of them, you need to have some kind of network bridge. You need to have really, really, really good interpersonal skills, what, what sociologists refer to as you know, social and cultural capital. And you need to have, you really need to have network ties. And you need to be able to have the amount of kind of um, 
family financial resources that they can like set you up in in big cities after graduation to help you get your career launch. It just, it's a, these, a lot of these careers are really hard to do if you're if you don't have um, a lot of resources. So and so a career in this field would be one of them. So okay, so they're going on in their part your partying careers or their college career. They're partying hard. Naomi on her awesome 2.45 GPA. Um, we were trying to kind of get some, some um, insight into this, and, she, and Laura, who interviewed her, was trying to figure out like what she was doing. She was like, you know, um, are you hooking up? Um, is not the boyfriend, but just random guys? Yes. Going out a lot? Yes. You were hungover the next day? And she's like, yeah, I was just being lazy. I had a bunch of classes that I didn't enjoy. So she's just like, she is utterly un unapologetic about this. She's just like, college is, the academic side is just kind of stupid. I don't know why I'm supposed to be doing this like academic thing. She's not, this is not something she feels like she has, there's no, uh, no apology here. Um, Karen, after having a pretty similar experience, eventually realizes she needs to transfer. So she's like, I needed to get away from MU, just get away from going out all the time and come here to the branch campus so I could focus on what my goal was for this part of my life. And her mom is like, by this point, totally annoyed. And her, her mom thinks that basically she's been sold a bill of goods. And she's like, I know it's gonna, now it's going to take two more years because nothing transfers. And I said, the school knows that. They make it sound like no big deal to change. That is your major. But yeah, they're making big bucks by the, kid, by the kids changing. So Karen's mom, by this point, feels like she's been betrayed by... Um, by this university. She sent her daughter there to major in elementary education. Her daughter changes to this major that she thinks is just completely ridiculous. And as it turns out, you know, there was pretty much no way Karen was likely to make a, a career in this field. She's like, that's sports, that's a hobby <laughs> from Karen's mom's perspective. She is not into this, like, go um, kind of be self-actualized, be passionate about whatever you want. She's like, you should have major in education. Um, okay. So, um, so in the meantime, while they're still in the sports field, Naomi does an unpaid internship in New York for the sports division of a major, uh, of a major network through a connection from her sister and had opportunities over the course of her career for more internships, which she turned down because she didn't feel like she needed them and wanted more leisure time. Karen, before she transferred back to elementary education, looked for internships, was unable to get any um, because she had no network ties to do that. Um, Naomi graduated with a 2.9 GPA, but just uh, she wasn't really sure about that, just like there was not really um, much of a knowledge about what her major was. But she graduated in four years. She fairly easily got a first job in New York as the executive assistant for a media company through her, her social skills and network ties. She was able to easily live in New York, even though she wasn't making very much money on this first job because her parents continued to support her um, along the way. Um, and she had a great social life. And so Karen, she transfers to the branch tra campus by this point. Her GPA is really low. And at the time we left her, she was on track to graduate in six years. But then we did the interviews at age 30. Anyone want to take bets on, on what, where Naomi and Karen are at age, age 30? Um, what's that? Uh, that's a good guess because, yeah, that is a good guess. Now that Naomi was married, um, that's a good guess. Any, um, anyone else want to? Like, say, same, the roughly, roughly same place? Um, it's another good guess, yeah. Okay. Well, actually, Naomi surprised us a little bit because um, Naomi was the single most successful financially of all of the women. She individually, at age 30, is making $210,000 a year as account executive living in Los Angeles. She was one of the few socialites who didn't go the marriage path yet. And she seemed to be utterly unconcerned about finding Mr. Right. She had no student loan let, a, debt. And in fact, she had just recently become financially independent because from her family's perspective, she needed to get to about $200,000 a year before they thought she could really make it on her own. So she was now independent. Um, and uh, she, was, she was loving her job. She loved life in Los Angeles. And she, was, uh, the, the, <laughs> she made the most money. 
Um, Karen was doing pretty well, actually, in a lot of ways. She was pretty happy. She was making $33,000 a year as a second grade teacher back in her small Midwestern town, living with her boyfriend who didn't have a college degree. They, um, I think we, we realized that they broke up like very shortly after we did this interview. And part of the reason she was sort of like having a lifestyle that was, that was recognizably middle class was that she was from a middle class background and her parents were able to buy her a house and pay off her student loans. And, and in the town she was living in, the houses were not that expensive and, and so forth. So she was, I mean, she was happy. Her life was fine, but the difference in terms of like um, the intellectual apparatus of, uh, of um, kind of sociology and kind of stratification thinking doesn't really have, um, can't really account for the how incredibly different their income is at age 30, given that they graduated with the same major with essentially, or, well, or, I mean, or, or they graduated with different majors, but at, at halfway through college, they looked roughly identical in terms of their level of academic investments. And just it's, but the differences are, are huge. Um, you know, and part of that is, I mean, it's, it's, not, um, it's not all class background and it's not all necessarily, um, you know, what I'll argue the university arrangements. I mean, part of it, they're just really different people. And Naomi, um, as kind of utterly blasé as she was <laughs> about, um, um, about her academics, it was really clear when we, from the time we met her that this young woman could talk. She could she could sell anything. I mean, she was, I mean, so she had a lot of kind of interactional, interpersonal, like skill and smarts, and she figured out how to leverage it, like exactly in, um, you know, in the, in the right world. And, and, but then being able to kind of leverage it in the right world was um, required an enormous amount of uh, network ties and to do that. So ended up hugely differently. So, but to really um, kind of bring it back to kind of like Kathy pointed out, this sort of structural piece of it, that the, that the university is not just kind of an empty um, kind of place where, you know, that's completely neutral, where people are meritocratically competing um, to see who, who comes out on top in terms of talent and skill and with everybody having kind of a level playing field. We argue and, and show in a, a variety of additional ways in the book that, in fact, that the university was, in fact, set up for Naomi. I mean, she had a great time. It was um, the experience was was easy and unproblematic. She had the college experience she expected and wanted, and her parents purchased for her. It was all great. She didn't need the school to really do much in terms of any kind of academic anything, and, and she felt that the school actually offered her a lot. Naomi was like, yeah, I, my social skills got better, I met a lot more people, I couldn't have gone and started this kind of career in the, the, you know, the field that she wanted to be in um, without the kind of additional polish and kind of interactional, social, cultural skills that she acquired in college. She didn't really need or want the academic part of it, but she knew that the, the kind of the stuff that she got in Greek life and, and the, the friends that she made, and that was all part of this kind of movement into this, into this um, particular life that she wanted to go to. But for Karen, the lure of the party pathway was a disaster. Um, she ended up nearly, you know, flunking out of school. Um, the provision of that sports communication major was like, didn't, did her no service at all. She got negligent, basically, advising, no help. And there was no assistance in finding summer internships so that she could have been successful at that sports communication career had she, you know, had she wanted to stick with it. I mean, it was just like, basically they just let her flounder. And she finally like got sorted out by, by transferring and kind of spending an additional um, two years. So, um, so that kind of, I'll open it up for questions now, but it, it, with, after the, with this after just concluding here that, um, that our argument there is that is that the the college experiences and the class trajectories out of college are shaped by this fit between the inst individual characteristics, what students bring with them, and the organizational characteristics, particularly these college pathways. And in fact, that we um, 
um, given the kind of relative scarcity, now, now increasing, but um, scarcity of kind of close ethnographic qualitative analysis of really what's happening to students with the perspective of kind of an organizational framework, we don't really know <laughs> about what pathways are like at other schools, like who's really served, um, who isn't. Um, and yeah, so there, there, I'll stop there and uh, any questions that you have, comments or sort of insights or thoughts on, on what's going on here would be great, yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. One second, I just want to make an announcement. There is a reception um, upstairs in Waterman Manor following the question and answer. So I know some people have to leave, but um, uh, if you can stay, you can probably, you know, chat yeah, with Elizabeth a little bit more. So yeah. I will handle the Q&A. So where is your hand up? Yeah. yeah okay. And she was right, she fast. Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. And then, yeah. Yeah. okay. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, first of all, mm -hmm. this, I learned a lot. Um, I commend you for living in a dorm. <laughs> I used to be a residential advisor and I'd never go back. Um, and I also think books like this really have the potential to change a student's college trajectory. Yeah. And I'm thinking of a specific book that I read when I was a, in between my sophomore and junior summer called Unhooked, How Young Women Pursue Sex, Delay Love, and Lose It Both, uh -huh. which was an undercover journalist who went on a campus and talked about the hookup culture. And my mom pushed it on me and I was like super against reading it. Mm -hmm. And it totally changed the way that I went back to college for the next two years mm -hmm. and pursued just my experience. So I'm kind of excited for the generation of students who get to then read this and reflect mm -hmm. on their own college experience. Mm -hmm. But I'm pretty interested in how you are defining your definition of success in this study, mm -hmm. because I'm just noticing um, we're calling $210,000 success. We're not calling $33,000 success. We're calling LA success. We're not calling teacher success. And while I think mm -hmm. there's lots and lots of different definitions of success, I'm wondering if you kind of chose one particular interpretation for the purpose That's of really good question. this yeah. research. Yeah, so what we did, um, and, and in fact, um, you know, we, we do consider um, Karen pretty successful, but, um, but what we tried to do, like at the, at the end of the book, is we tried to look at um, like several different dimensions at the same time, and qualitative research is more situated to do that than quantitative research, like sort of their, their own satisfaction with um, their college experience, their, their ability to get a job requiring a college degree, um, their um, likelihood of, um, this was a subtle one, of kind of moving into or living in a place where they might conceivably meet somebody to marry, um, like in their um, moving back home to their parents or kind of moving, it was, was potentially a problem. So also being able to live independently, um, issues about student loan debt. So, so in terms of when we kind of classified the students at the end according to like we, I'll go on to this next slide, in terms of the risk of downward mobility and the reproduction of privilege, we kind of looked at this like where did they start from um, in terms of where they were going to, were they going to be able to reproduce the kind of objective circumstances of their parents? Where, where did it look like they were ending up? Um, what was our sort of best guess at the time? And then a number of these kind of, you know, some more subjective parts of it too. So one of the things now we have to do with them at 30 is, is basically try to look at like, were we right or not? Like how, um, how, much on target were we? And we were wrong, actually, in, in, in pleasantly, we were pleasantly surprised at being wrong in terms of a number of the individuals who we thought were at risk of downward mobility did a lot better than we expected. Um, and that was really nice, um, particularly um, some of the, um, the individuals from less privileged backgrounds, they were, they, they were the, the kind of grit and resilience and all of that actually really paid off in ways that we were like, oh, go. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, that, that in terms of the normative aspects of that, that's really, that, that's very important not to just equate financial success with success. You had, there was somebody. Right, the right there. Right here, okay. Hi, so you said that um, in terms of like where they ended up, 
uh, the more like successful, per not successful, but the person from the affluent background was in LA, the other person was in a mid small Midwestern town. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you found any other like geographical disparities or like spatial patterns of where they ended up as a result of their college process? Yeah, there were huge patterns in that, in that um, the, the individuals from out of state almost all went back um, to where they came from. And the individuals from in-state, um, um, most of them didn't leave the state or didn't move very far. Um, and so part of that was, I mean, part of that was just like everybody tends to go back where they come from, kind of, but also that people um, from more privileged backgrounds have, are more geographically mobile. And so one of the things, for example, Karen, um, she, her kind of class background was such that neither she nor her family thought it was a normal or appropriate thing to do to move very far away from where she grew up. And one of the things she didn't understand about this career in sports was that generally people who are successful make like really lots and lots of moves, like five or six moves over a period of 10 years, like really like big spatial moves. And that was, so that's an, so another, um, most, as we know, as I mean, some of, some of you, you know, may have, have read, you know, this is more and more in the news that we're having a kind of geographic kind of polarization happening in the U.S. where more and more opportunity is concentrated in fewer and fewer big urban areas with less jobs, less opportunity in small towns or kind of in, and so, individuals who graduate from college, if they will not or cannot move to opportunity, which is basically um, exists in, you know, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and or graduate school, wherever graduate schools are. If, if, if one stays in, I don't know, like some small, tiny little town, it's like you are out of um, good, good job markets. You just, you can't, you can't not stay in these places and, and kind of move into the sort of upper 20% really anymore. I mean, which is, which is bad. I mean, that, but that's a, a, a problem. So I'm going to let you call on people mm -hmm. and then I'll just chase. Okay. How about back, back there? Yeah. Right here. Okay. Hello. Mm -hmm. Um, I just have one question. So whatever yeah. this is an institution failure, not be able to um, um, educate or like shows the students how they could be able to under their, understand their own intellectual disciplines. There are eight different types of intelligence today. Like so there's a musical intelligence, engineer, like mm -hmm. mathematical intelligence, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, nature intelligence. That is it because the failure of the institutions in the first year didn't really explain how the students shall use their own human capital to invest on the university, be able to comprehend the essence of the education. In leading today, like the, such a thing, the material recognition is overwhelming represent the students, the essence of the humanity. Like for instance, like in the East, in Hong Kong, or like in Singapore, Singapore is the best education system in the world. The reason why they can do that, because in the first year, they teach philosophy, teaching the student be able to understand what the distance between the materials and individuals. Then in leading the t t today, the student could be able to know what they really want. Then they can study so hard. So I wonder if this is the reason why that in the West, in the first year, does not really teach the student how they could be understand themselves in order to invest the education system in the first year. Yeah, that, that, uh, that would, the school definitely failed completely in terms of what you're suggesting. But the failure was like even more profound. Um, for students, particularly um, individuals from um, kind of on the mobility pathway, when we were on the dorm floor and they were talking about their experiences during the first couple weeks of their freshman year, they were reporting things like so, I went to this math class, and it turns out it was a remedial math class, not counting for college credit. They were like, um, uh, the person was incredibly condescending and, and a terrible instructor. And then my other instructor didn't show up. Um, 
the third instructor was so ancient, I thought maybe that he was gonna like keel over and die like in the middle of like the class. I mean, they're, you know, 18. I mean, who knows? That might have been someone who was 50. I don't know. But, but the fact of it was is they, they were coming back and reporting that not, it wasn't just that, the, the, that they didn't have a great philosophy class, like uh, having them interrogate kind of human values and where they might fit in the world they were in, in, um, encountering the dregs of the instructional faculty because, I mean, as many of those who are faculty in this room know, like one of the ways that the university works is that the more, basically the more successful faculty are, the, le the uh, more um, uh, um, privilege they have to select whether they teach, whom they teach, the conditions under which they teach, and so often the faculty that, you, that should be engaged in teaching the students with, that most need to really be pulled in and engaged and essentially are potentially struggling, those are the individuals who are most likely to get the worst of the instructional staffing of the entire university. They're, they're going to get like just people who are not often. I mean, it depends. Universities can do it differently. I mean, universities can make a concerted effort to make sure that their very, very best instructors are teaching um, the students who are most at risk of, of not succeeding. But very, very often, it's the opposite. It's the other way around. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in the, another one in the back okay. there. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you for your book. Um, I have two questions kind of piggybacking on that question, uh, or the first one kind of does. Um, I have a little brother who is currently 18 and in his first year at Midwest U. Oh, okay. Um, from, yeah, okay. from a, um, like a lower middle class background. And I'm wondering if you have any advice for like how what to. What dorm is he in? I don't. I think the musicians <laughs> dorm. Oh, he's probably okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, oh. good. But yeah, just like advice for like navigating resources successfully, like without too much social capital going in. Uh -huh. And then my second question is like on the organizational side of things. Mm -hmm. Like, do you think if you mentioned that like public universities are sort of money hungry for? Uh, kids who can pay full tuition or out-of-state tuition. I'm wondering if you think that if there were any changes in like funding structures to like channel more money into public institutions that they would like consider like you know that there's any possibility that like the structures would change to be more beneficial for everyone? Yeah, no, I, I, do, th I do think that um, that um, more public investment in higher education makes it make more sense for universities to build out mobility pathways and to cap and potentially push back on party pathways. And to the extent that universities are kind of highly, highly dependent on um, tuition or on kind of um, the kind of corporate sector or kind of on, on making a kind of pleasant consumer experience, I think it becomes really, really hard to build out the supports. Um, and I mean, I think specifically, um, like in terms of advice for your brother, um, I'd, I, one of the things I would say is stay away from the party pathway. Um, find every other, any other niche on campus. Hang out with the musicians. Hang, hang out, go live in the alternative uh, dorm. Uh, you know, if, if someone's um, kind of become, go uh, work in the lab for a biology professor, um, join the outdoor adventure club, um, uh, just that one of, if, if, if this kind of upper middle class white uh, party oriented kind of world, if it's, if it's kind of segregated from everything else. It can potentially contaminate everything else less, but it's hard. I mean, so, so in, it's a lot of, at, at, the, at Midwest University, there was a lot of what I called protective segregation going on. The honors students were in the honors dorm. 
all, like virtually all of the students of color were in some kind of living learning center devoted to ethnicity. Um, um, so there was just, it was what was, we had of the, the two lesbians on our floor, they, one left the university and the other left the residence hall. I mean, it was impossible. And we had, there were no students of color on the floor. All these women were white, but it would have been really bad for anyone who was not white on this, on this floor. So it's, it's um, if these cultures get really geared up and going, the kind of, the only thing to do is avoid them. And it's possible, it's possible. Um, yeah. Up in the front, this um, Wait, so hold on, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, My question is directed more towards Greek life, mm -hmm. and I wanted to know your opinion on basically how Greek life Im influenced your study, but also um, elimin eliminating Greek life altogether, because in my undergrad, I feel like that is what dictated the social culture and a lot of the negative things that you talked about. <laughs> yeah, Greek life is a real challenge. It's um, it's baked into the DNA of uh, big time American colleges and universities. It's really, and it's bizarre, it's bizarre. Um, particularly the kind of white kind of IFC pan howls, like kind of specifically what I'm referring to, not the kind of multicultural, or the African American sororities and fraternities, but the, but the notion that there are um, organizations that are exclusive by race, class, gender, sexuality, nationality, ability, and like pretty much every other dimension, and they are allowed to exist on college and university campuses that profess to value diversity and inclusion is just profoundly odd. And of course the organizations are like, oh, we're very inclusive. Our, the, on, uh, at Midwest University it's like, we're really inclusive. We allow brunette girls too. <laughs> um, yeah, the, this, it was 99 you know, 0.5% white Greek life at, at Midwest University. I mean, it's, but then, then, so given all of that, it's like, well, why, why are these organizations so hard to get rid of? And it's money, power, housing, alumni, um, kind of all, all kinds of pressures. And then they say, then there's the like, well, can they be reformed? And um, I was just reading American Hookup, which I would definitely recommend by Lisa Wade, um, who kind of, she takes, she, she draws on a lot of the themes of, of the work that I've done and then takes it another step f further and it's really readable. It's a trade book, it's awesome. Anyway, the, she, um, she talks about how the founding moment of fraternities was to create socially class, race, gender, socially exclusive social organizations. That was their point from the beginning. Um, so there, it's not like they're, I mean, yes, there are all these kind of philanthropic claims that they make, but I mean, really there's, the, but it's hard. So, I mean, one thing I've thought about in terms of strategies like that, I, I kind of, whenever I kind of get in front of a university president, one of the things I try to encourage is like, come up with the action plan for the next crisis. What happens when a fraternity burns down and 25 kids die? Um, it will happen, um, something like that, something bad, it's inevitable. Um, what, will, what is the plan? Have it lined up for 50 different universities to act all at once. Like, because you can't act one at a time. If it's just Ohio State that eliminates Greek life, then um, the kids go to University of Illinois, right? You can't, they go, you know, you, you, you have, there needs to be more coordination among high level academic leadership on this. And this is a, this is a necess not necessarily a one year plan, but a five year plan, a 10 year plan, a 20 year plan. What is the long term collective game plan for pushing back on these organizations? Um, and, and thinking about, thinking about um, like what to, hap what, what to do when the next really, really horrible thing happens and have that strategy ready to go. Because it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to make big, big moves without a, without, a, without a crisis. But the crisis is inevitable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
right there. I'm sorry, who was? Uh, uh, yeah, in the right third row. Um, so this question might seem a little bit counterintuitive, but I was thinking, do you think um, universities such as MU are actually doing a disservice to the students by offering majors such as sports communication or like by expanding their choices to, let's say, rather not as applicable majors? Yes. I, I, I do um, think that um, that universities have a responsibility to make sure that all of the ac academic content provided is of high quality. Um, and I mean, one, I think, of the reasons why um, affluent parents, particularly professional parents, particularly academic parents, um, go really far out of their way and spend a huge amount of money to send their children to the Swarthmores and the um, Oberlins and the Reeds of the world is that is that the low quality majors are defined off the table. It's like, but the schools make it impossible to screw up beyond a certain point by setting the, the, the parameters and the contours. And the parents may not fully be aware of that in terms of going like, I'm, I'm sending my kid to Swarthmore so they can't major in sports communication. But I think if you ask most, um, I don't know, like parents who are like engineers, like uh, if, you know, <laughs> if what their values are they would say uh yeah i would send i would pay the additional money to send my kid to swarthmore so they so that option isn't available so i think um so but not everybody can go to swarthmore so then that then the responsibility for public universities is to is to make sure that the the educational offerings are um, of rigor and high quality and there, um, one of the kind of themes in the book is like how faculty are implicated in all of this. And this is, um, faculty are not off the, off the hook. I mean, one of the things that uh, we refer to in there is in uh, borrowing the scholarship of other people too, you know, citing them, is this kind of notion of a disengagement contract that this kind of like faculty who are really research oriented, they um, can kind of basically make a deal with their students. I won't ask anything of you. I'll give you three multiple choice exams and let you take off for two weeks for spring break. If you like, let me do my research, don't come the office hours and don't bother me. Um, and so, so faculty are not necessarily fulfilling their obligations to students by, by not demanding more intellectually. So I was just told that uh, it's time to wrap it up so that we can go upstairs for the reception. So um, I join me in uh, applauding Elizabeth for her great talk. And